Greetings and welcome. My name is Farzad Amuzagar. I am an adjunct assistant professor at UCLA Herb Albert School of Music and the director of Iranian Music Program. It is my honor to welcome you to the second of our two talks. Today we present the singer and composer Azam Ali. This Iranian music conference series is made possible thanks to generous support from the Farhang Foundation the UCLA Herb Albert School of Music Department of Ethnomusicology, and the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies, with additional support from the Dean of the UCLA Herb Albert School of Music. While the pandemic has brought great challenges for all of us, it has been rewarding and exciting to be part of the new Iranian music program. I'm thankful to Eileen Strumpel, the inaugural Dean of the UCLA Herb Albert School of Music, and Mark Clickman, the chair of Ethnomusicology. I'm also grateful to Farhang Foundation for their generous donation and support in making the Iranian music program a reality. I'm particularly thankful to Mr. Ali Azhar Dakhani, the executive director of the Farhang Foundation for his help and partnership in organizing the Iranian music conference series. Today, close to 400 people are joining us. This speaks to the partnership with Farhang Foundation, the importance of Iranian music program, and of course, the important role Azam plays as a female singer in Iranian music. I invite Mr. Erdekani to speak to our partnership. Ali Reza. Greetings, and thank you, Dr. Amuzegar, for your kind words, and thank you to all our guests who are joining us today from all over the world. On behalf of Farhang Foundation, we are so proud to support this conference series and the entire Iranian music program at UCLA's Herb Albert School of Music. It is truly an honor for Farhang to have been instrumental in establishing this historic program at UCLA. And we are grateful to all our members and specifically to all our donors who have helped make this program a reality. I have to extend my thanks and gratitude to Dean Eileen Strempel for her leadership, as well as to Chair Mark Kildman for his support. I'm also extremely excited to welcome the fabulous Azam Ali, today's esteemed speaker who has been a longtime Farhang collaborator. We are big admirers of her work and her music and are thrilled to help support and present today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ali Reza. Um, it is my honor now to introduce Azam Ali. In a career which spans two decades that includes 13 collaborative and solo albums, as well as two prestigious Canadian Juno Award nominations and one Hollywood Music Award, Azam, Az Azam Ali has confirmed her place as one of the gifted singers and composers on the international stage. Born in Iran, raised in India from the age of four and currently based in Los Angeles, Azam's most notable work is with the cutting edge electronic acoustic project, Niaz. Niaz has released four best-selling and critically acclaimed albums on Six Degrees Records. All four albums have de debuted as number one on iTunes, providing the band with an incredible amount of media attention, including features on NPR, the BBC, Huffington Post, and Billboard. Shortly after moving to the United States, Azam began studying the Santur, Persian hammer dulcimer, under the guidance of Persian master musician Manu Cheher Sadari. It was through his encouragement that Azam began to explore her voice as the vehicle through which she would finally be able to fully express herself. As a voice which Billboard magazine would later describe as a glorious, unforgettable instrument. After receiving formal training as a Western trained vocalist, Azam extended her musical education into India, Persian, and Eastern European vocal techniques. Before the pandemic, Azam continued to tour internationally with Niaz in a new multimedia show, The Four Light Project, which has been presented in some of the most prestigious performing art centers throughout America. The Four Light Project combines live musical and dance performance with interactive technologies and advanced projections, body mapping techniques that respond to sound and movement in real time. 
the synthesis of sound, space, image, and light invites the audience to share a unique narrative and multi-sensory experience. I'm delighted to say that the Four Light Project will be showcased at UCLA next year. Please joining me in welcoming Azam Ali. Azam? Hello, everyone. It, it is my great honor to be here today. I would like to really thank you, Professor Farzad Amuzagar, for this great honor. I was truly honored when you called me and asked me to, to give a talk on my experiences, both as an Iranian woman, as an artist, I would also like to thank the UCLA's Herb Albert School of Music, the Dean, and of course, Farhan Foundation, whom I truly treasure, particularly Ali Reza Ardekhani. I often think what it would have been like for me when I was a teenager starting out in America, in the music industry, and if there was an organization like Farhang Foundation, how different things would have been for me and how much less I would have struggled. So I'm very grateful that they exist for the younger generation. And I hope that I can continue to be of service um, in any way that I can be. I know we've all sat through so many Zoom conferences for this past year. So I had actually prepared a PowerPoint and I've decided not to show the PowerPoint and really make it more of a, just take you through a journey of my lived experiences and how these experiences have shaped my music as well as my artistic philosophies. The PowerPoint is available for those in academia who would like to maybe perhaps look at the arch of this talk. I have given it to Professor Amuzagar, so you're more than welcome to ask him for it and I'm happy to share it. If there are any points you want later for me to elaborate on, I am at your service. Um, so for, I, I will begin, I will follow my PowerPoint myself and I will show some music clips as well. Before I begin, there are two things I want to say. One is that music for me has always been much more than an artistic expression. It has really been my lifeline to the world as an Iranian in diaspora. And the other very important thing is I will be discussing some things which are some topics which are very subjective and objective. So there are no absolute truths in anything I'm going to speak about. I am 100% speaking about my lived experiences, my own personal observations in the music industry and how my personal philosophies have been shaped. So with that in mind, I, I would like to begin with the concept of identity. For me, identity is the most important, perhaps of all the points I wish to discuss about. When I examine the trajectory of my life and career, identity is the point of origin from which all of my artistic expressions have emanated and even personal expressions. Anyone who has struggled with the concept of identity will tell you that it is something that is perpetually under construction. There is never a moment of arrival or a sense of completion. So where is our first sense of identity formed? The first sphere within which we form a sense of identity is the nuclear family. This is where we learn our traditions, our values, where we develop a sense of self and feel like we belong to something more whole. However, for those of us who experienced the Iranian revolution, it not only sentenced millions of us to a life in diaspora, but the first thing it did was strip us of our identity. 
now you combine that with the fact that a lot of us, like myself, we were sent off at very young age. In my case, I was four years old when I was sent to study in an English boarding school in India. So now I had lost both a homeland and the nuclear family. And there are many other Iranians like myself who were not fortunate enough to move with their nuclear families. So how do you even begin to form a sense of identity when you have lost both of these? And then you add to that the fact that we live in a world in which we are constantly being asked to identify ourselves, our ethnicity, our sexual orientation, our religious affiliation, our political affiliation. So perhaps it's because I lost the sense of identity at such a young age that I've always despise definitions and also my philosophy at a young age was formed that we are born with this tremendous gift to be able to create ourselves in the way that we imagine in a, in a sense our greatest work of art is who we make ourselves the rest is quite arbitrary if you consider our place of birth, the family we were born into, the body we were born into, the religion we were born into. It is perhaps the most arbitrary event in any human being's life. And for me to have built an identity around that always felt incredibly foolish. So in a sense, now when I look back on my life, I feel that the greatest gift I was given is that I became a foreigner at the age of four. At the age of four, I knew what it is to be a foreigner, to embrace this figure of otherness. So one of the first, second stages that you face from loss of identity is assimilation. Every immigrant at some point is going to face the pressure and reality of assimilation. Fortunately, in my case, because I had moved to India, I, I can say that assimilation had almost become part of my DNA at this point. But moving to the West was a different matter altogether. When I came to America, the first thing I struggled with was discovering I was a Middle Eastern person. I, it's really something I, I never ever thought about. So the way I looked, the way I spoke, and then later on the way I was expressing myself was, was extremely different. And I, I did struggle with that aspect of assimilation. And the problem with assimilation, one of the problems is that you can very quickly become a victim of foreign ideas. And in my sense, that came in the form of embracing this Orientalist archetype that was projected upon me when I came to America, this romanticized, exotic, erotic, mysterious woman. And even when I listen to some of my earlier works, if I had to be honest, I would have to say that I feel that I was almost expressing myself with a kind of borrowed language. It wasn't my own voice. It wasn't my vision to some degree. And I was also struggling with another dichotomy, which was that I, here I was benefiting from my Orientalism while my people and Middle Eastern people at large, but particularly Iranians, were being perceived by the public and presented by the media as a threat, not just to America, but to Western world at large. So this was something I knew I was going to have to reconcile within myself. 
I would have to credit Edward Said's writing, writings on Orientalism for kind of blowing this whole thing wide open for me. When I read his writings, what I learned is that in order for me to find my own voice, to find my vision and know where I wanted to situate my work as an artist, I needed to be able to begin to see myself outside of this Eurocentric lens. So that began a whole new journey for me. And it still continues to this day. I have to always check myself to be sure that I am not pandering to these reductionist constructs of what an Eastern person does or says, because inevitably that would always put me in a submissive role. Then from there, I would have to say the third phase is one of reclamation. So I kind of see this as a three-part movement. There's the loss of identity, which is perpetually under construction. There's assimilation, which is a very transitional phase. In my case, I, I, it had a very clear beginning and a very clear end. And then came reclamation. And reclamation, like loss of identity, is also something that for me is perpetually under construction. Because when you lose your homeland and you lose your family, which so many of us have done, we are all separated from one another. So there's no connection to anything. You, you find it virtually impossible to feel at home anywhere. And you spend a lifetime, at least I have spent a large part of my life, and I think I will continue to as long as I'm here, to try to feel a sense of home somewhere in the world, to try to feel tethered to something that even remotely feels like home. So this is something that is perpetually under construction for me as well. Now I'll go into the beginning of my journey as an artist. So the first phase was having to break with gender norms. This was really my first act of resistance as, as an artist, is breaking with the gender norms in a very patriarchal Iranian society. Like most parents, my mother would have loved for me to become a doctor or a lawyer or an architect, or even the wife of one would have been more preferable than the path that I wanted to choose. But I was fortunate that my mother was an incredibly progressive woman. She was educated, she was a nurse, and she was also a single mother. Uh, she raised me alone. So she was incredibly supportive of me following my vision. And I remember when I had the green light to do whatever I wanted and it was no longer going to reflect on her or my family. I recall feeling such a sense of triumph. And that was until I entered the male dominated music industry and discovered that there are actually very clear gender roles and boundaries there. So the music industry, this is where I once again wanna remind everybody that there are no absolute truths in anything that I say. These are my experiences. And please always keep that in mind. So the predominant structure of the music industry is a very hypersexualized one in which the focal point is the male gaze. And the first reality you face as a woman is that you can only be invited into the fold by male power holders. And once you enter, you are in one form or another expected to participate in and uphold this structure. So here I was once again, struggling with my role as a woman. 
And in my case, there was an added issue, which was that I was a Middle Eastern woman. And I discovered very quickly that my, for lack of a better word, exoticism could be commodified through fetishizing, through romanticizing, othering, and perhaps the most difficult of all is the exploitation of my struggles and my suffering. This is a very important point because I have been in America and I've lived in Canada as well. So I've lived in Northern America for 35 years, of, more than 35 years now of my life, 35 years of my life. And I've left Iran since I was four, but to this day when an event occurs anywhere in the Middle East, and if I happen to be touring and giving interviews, I'm expected to have an opinion about what is happening there or every time I give an interview, I'm expected to discuss about what it is like to be an Iranian woman and not be able to sing in my own country. And to some degree, I think it's okay to answer those, those questions, but I struggle with them mainly because I have no idea what it is like to be a singer and to live in Iran. And I feel it is an injustice for me to speak on behalf of a woman who does, who is living in that society every day and cannot sing freely. So for me to speak on her behalf would do her experience such injustice. So this is what I mean when I say that sometimes you can be exploited. And I really wanted my music and my art to remain uncontaminated by these kinds of strictures. So this was really my second act of resistance is this non-compliance with this role that was being assigned to me in the music industry. It did keep me in the wind for a while, but I will credit one man for, for really giving me the start in my career. His name is Wesley Van Linda, and he had a record label called Narada Records, which doesn't exist anymore. It was bought by Virgin Records. But this is in the early 90s. He heard my music, and he, he heard it, some of my music on a cassette tape, a demo I had made. And he called me and flew me out and my partner at that time the next day. and. And within three days, I had signed my first record deal. And he pretty much said to me, go make the art you want to make, present yourself the way you want to present yourself. And it was just 100% freedom of expression. And he gave me the start in my career. So I owe him a lot. And it's important for me to say that anyone who wants to become an artist, that you have a very clear vision of how you want to be presented. Make sure you are creating yourself and that someone else is not creating you. So there began my, my journey. Now I want to talk about another very important point, which is the hierarchy in the music industry. So for those of you who are not familiar with the music industry, the music industry, you can think of it as a sort of capitalist cultural industry with two very distinct categories, music that is commercially viable and music that is culturally viable. And within this system, there's a very clear hierarchical structure in which there is a dominant narrative which decides for us which styles of music have greater commercial value or cultural value or which are, have greater legitimacy. This becomes important because it also determines how funding is assigned to certain musical expressions. The most obvious example I can offer here is in relation to classical music. 
why is classical music given a superior status above all other musical expressions? This is an, a question I often ask students when I am speaking with university students or college students. I ask them to think about this. And I even ask those in those professionals in the music industry, if I'm giving a talk in conferences to think about this. Why, why is it that classical music has, has been given superior status? I'm sure everybody has their own answer for it. I, I can only offer mine through my observations and experience and struggles within you know, the industry. If you examine the roots of classical music in both Western and music, and Western and Eastern music, it is very much connected to class legacy because it was largely funded by the wealthy, the elite, kings, the courts, and often even the church. And it was highly competitive. In order for anyone to make a living as a musician and to be able to break that barrier to play at that level, you had to become highly skilled, highly sophisticated, and incredible craftsmanship. But that's not the case anymore. Nowadays, despite your social or economic status, anyone can learn how to play a classical instrument, can have access to classical music, and now we hear classical music everywhere. It no longer just belongs to the upper class. You hear classical music being played in subway stations. My point is not so much about classical music. You know, in fact, my, my son plays cello and his passion is Western classical music and Western classical music is a big part of my life because of my son. The point here I'm trying to make is, is a much more subtle one. And that is that I want to point out that it is a belief system that has created this aura of truth. And beliefs only take on an aura of truth when they are invested with power. So that's really the point that I'm trying to make with this hierarchical system. That it is not really truths, but beliefs that determine the cultural value, the monetary value, the status, or the legitimacy of an art form. I would use myself as an example here. I studied Persian classical music, as, as Professor Almuzagar already mentioned earlier. For eight years, I studied Persian classical music under the great master Ostad Manucher Sadegi. And I was well on my way to becoming quite an accomplished uh, musician. But every time I projected this vision of myself as a classical musician, it just never really fit. Because one of the things I discovered as I was studying classical music is that music really serves two roles in society. One is to preserve culture and tradition, and two, to push past individual and national boundaries. And for me, I knew that what was driving me was innovation. And my life up to that point had already been pushing individual and national boundaries. So I knew that my music and my art needed to reflect that. It needed to express that, that I was not here to carry on an existing tradition. And I found it extremely limiting. And I would say to some degree, even artistically inhumane to expect any artist to express themselves honestly within this, within the confines of this apparatus of the dominant narrative. So that is why I, I really want to make that point. When I say that I was driven by innovation and that I was not here to carry on a musical tradition, 
what was driving me was that I had an interest in my legacy, the past, ancient folkloric music. That was really where my passion was, but I was much more interested in the juxtaposition of that with the mechanical world, the technological world, and how these two can coexist. I knew my musical expression was not going to fit into the traditional world music mold. I knew it was going to be rejected by purists. I knew that I was going to have to swim upstream against the current if I wanted to push past the invisible and visible boundaries. But uh, it was a journey I was happy to undertake. So with my first group, Voss, that's really what we started to do. But it's not until I created Niaz with Ramin Torkian and Carmen Rizzo that this vision really crystallized itself. We were very much interested in creating the synthesis of something organic, how you can take these old instruments, wood and the human voice, and put it against these machines in a way that it creates this new kind of hybrid of sound, but it's done in such a sophisticated and tasteful way that you cannot tell where the acoustic instruments end and where the electronic sounds are beginning. It took us actually a very long time to find this balance I remember at the time when our first album came out, the, we, on one hand, it was celebrated as this, that we had spearheaded this completely new style and this new genre. And on the other hand, in the world music scene, the, among the purists, it was this sort of bastard child, this completely illegitimate musical expression. And this, the one phrase we always kept hearing was it was not authentic enough. But the reality is that we ended up spearheading a sound and a style that today is a completely established genre in the music industry that's both commercially viable and it's also culturally re relevant. In the, in the global music scene. So this was my third act of resistance as an artist is challenging this hierarchical structure that assigns some musical expressions a higher status than others and wants to determine for audiences which music is more commercially viable or more culturally relevant. I think this would be a good point to play one of the earliest videos of Niaz, so you can hear um, what our music sounded like when we first launched it and one of our first videos. So I'm going to quickly show that before I continue. Hari 
Okay, so that was Niaz at the beginning. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about the subject called artistic literacy. So one of the things that Ramin and I have been really involved with over the past four or five years is we no longer just go to universities just to perform um, as part of the performing arts series. We're, we're doing more and more residencies. So they last anywhere from three days to five days. And it's wonderful because we get to go and have workshops with students, we give lectures. So by the time we've had the, we are having the performance, we know so many of the students and the faculty. So as a result of that, we are also now engaged in a lot of conferences with other professionals. And one of the conferences that we attended a couple of years ago was at the University of Berkeley. We were invited to speak at a conference called Artistic Literacy. And I was not familiar with it so much back then, but the director of Artistic Literacy, her name is Sabrina Klein, an incredible woman who I credit with creating artistic literacy. And I have promised her since I came out of that conference that wherever I go and I have a chance to speak, I will talk a bit about artistic literacy. So artistic literacy, simply put, is a basic human right on par with linguistic and numerical literacy. It means that every human being regardless of their social or economic status, should be provided with the knowledge and skills in order to connect meaningfully to art. Because when we connect meaningfully to art, we connect to our own humanity, and that allows us to connect to the humanity of others. So ultimately, artistic literacy is about access. If we are to examine our each of our own pedagogy. We are all taught how to talk, how to walk, how to eat, how to dress ourselves. We grow up, we go to school, we learn math, science, English, so on and so forth. Yet how many of us since childhood were taught how to consume art in a meaningful way? How many of us were taught how to listen to music deeply in a way that we are elevated by it. And yet, if you consider it, music is piped into our lives from the moment that we are born. We hear it at home in the background, we hear it at the supermarket, we hear it at the bank, we hear it even in elevators, everywhere. We hear it when we're holding the phone and waiting for someone to come on the line. So from childhood, for most people, listening to music is an incredibly passive act. When in reality, if we are taught how to listen to music deeply, it influences the sensorium in a profound way. It inspires deep observation. It inspires deep reflection and it has a tremendous power of transformation. So I believe it is this lack of artistic literacy that has contributed a great deal to why music out of most of the art forms has such little monetary value in society. No one goes into an art gallery, for example, and expects to walk out with a painting for free. No one walks into a bookstore and expects to walk out with a book for free. And yet, music is something people always expect for free. I can tell you that sometimes I spend three months composing and recording, producing a single song that's maybe four minutes. And at best, I would be able to sell this song for 99 cents on iTunes. This is where for me academia and art intersect. This is why I want to do artistic residencies at, at the educational level, because when we go in as artists to speak with students, we approach this subject differently. 
I can feel the classroom transform when we speak about these subjects because we bring, first we bring it out of this abstract realm where it's just a concept and we make it tangible for students. And an appreciation for art and performance. So artistic literacy needs to become a, an integral part of our educational system. And this is something that I will advocate on, on, as long as I'm here on earth. I have to be careful of time. So I'm going to quickly move on to music and technology because this is another subject I'm quite passionate about. So as part of our residencies, this is one of the subjects we cover a lot. And actually this one, my partner Ramin Torkian usually gives. So I'm carrying the mantle for him today by, by presenting this, this segment um, for you. So as you've seen, and you will see, I will show one more video. Technology is a big part of mine and Niaz's musical expression. The, I remember when we first started Niaz, there was so much resistance to the fact that we were including electronic elements into very traditional folk songs and these ancient poems that we were sort of resurrecting and creating new music around. So I like to remind people that contrary to popular belief, technology has always been a part of music since its inception. It began with kinetic energy. We started making better sounding instruments. Then we started building better sounding halls in order to enhance our experience. Then came electricity and this revolutionized the way we experience music. Up until then, we had to sit in the same room with musicians to hear music. Now you had one powerful element, which was amplification. Every instrument could be amplified. Then it could be recorded. And now we could listen to music in any environment. We could sit in our own homes and listen to any concerto that we wished. So electricity also transformed music and it also transformed actually the role of certain instruments. For example, guitar was always a, a support instrument and with amplification, it became a lead instrument. So it transformed music in that sense. Then came the digital era, and this is the era we are currently in. This was the advent of innovative music technologies, such as software-based vir virtual instruments, um, MIDI technology that now offers us access to literally millions of sounds that we can use to produce our music and millions of sounds that we can manipulate in highly co complex ways. So, so in reality, technology has always reshaped and enhanced both the expression for artists and the experience of listening to music. And yet at every stage there has been resistance. It has been met with resistance. And now we are about to enter a new era, which is the virtual reality era. And already this past year, we have been commissioned to compose music for a couple of virtual reality projects. And now music is going to completely change again because it's no longer going to be experienced one dimensionally. Now we're talking about mixing in surround sound, not just mixing in surround sound, but actually writing and recording in surround sound. So now we have to think about where we're going to place instruments. It's really what's going to go behind you to the side. And you know this, this is going to completely change. So the creative potential of music is boundless. And 
this is really where my interest lies. And here I want to show a clip of our multimedia project, The Fourth Light, which Professor Almuzaga uh, referred to earlier. So The Fourth Light project is actually a, a project we launched when we were living in Montreal. We created it in Montreal with um, interactive designer and virtual artist, Jérôme de Lapierre. And it is a, an immersive multimedia experience in which we combine live musical performance and dance performance with interactive technologies. And we use body mapping and projections to that's respond to sound and movement in real time. And as Farzad said earlier, it's really a synthesis of sound and light, uh, space. It's um, what we like to call a digital sonography. It's creating an environment in which virtual and real space merge to create this illusionistic three-dimensional environment in that we can bring the audience into. More and more we are interested in how can you separate this distance between the performer and the observer, the audience. So this is kind of the direction we're moving into. Normally this show is, is has one main projector, but the clip I'm going to show is from a residency that we had in, in France a few years ago where we were invited to transform this ancient cathedral. Um, not just transform it, but we were asked to map our show to the architecture of this cathedral. So instead of one projector, we ended up using six projectors. Uh, Jérôme put uh, two frontals and then two on either side. So no matter where you sat as, the, as an audience member, you were immersed in the art that was being created. It, it's an incredibly difficult show to capture on camera, but um, hopefully this will give you some idea of it. So I, I would like to show that and then we can come back and talk a bit more. <laughs> So that's the fourth light project. And um, that's, that's something that we are more and more interested in doing now. It's, it's a bit difficult to find places to do, do that in America, just much more for logistic and legal reasons. Uh, but being able to transform architecture, even the facades of, of certain buildings. Um, I want to quickly cover one other aspect of uh, technology, which, which is quite relevant. It's a different aspect of technology. And um, 
that's how technology has actually transformed the musical industry in itself. So as with all phenomenon, technology has its dualistic nature. We, we all see the negative side of it in our personal lives, how it can be sometimes intrusive, addictive. Um, the good side of what technology has done to the music industry is that it, democrat it democratized music. We had this really unjust model before that. And what it did would, was it really dismantled this model and it took out the middleman and allowed artists to have direct access to their fans. The other good side is places like YouTube and iTunes. Once again, it offered a lot more artists to be able to create music and to have direct access to their audiences. So the democratization of music was perhaps the best thing that happened um, in terms of technology. The downside to that is the sore point for me is platforms like Spotify. So now you have, there are two downsides. For me, I would have to say the creation of the MP3 was the beginning of the downfall of music because sonically it really brought the quality of music down. We spent thousands of dollars in state-of-the-art studios recording, mixing, mastering, all so that it can be crushed to this MP3 format and people end up listening to it on their iPhones or laptop speakers or those iPod, those Apple iPods. So the deterioration of the quality of music is one very negative aspect of it. And the platforms like Spotify, which I personally refuse to use, um, my husband uses it. I don't judge him for it, but I, I refuse to use it because I see the, the paychecks that go to artists, um, despite millions and millions of streams. So this is the downside of the digital era for me. Um, I'm hoping that we can kind of find some kind of a happy medium in the future for musicians to be able to earn a better living. I cannot imagine if I was starting my career now. I, I feel that I have garnered the success that I have primarily because I, I came in right at the cusp before the collapse of the music industry. So in the 90s, the mid to late 90s, it was still thriving. And I built a large part of my audience then. Um, I think I, I should wrap this up now quickly. So I'm going to end with um, art and resistance, an important subject. So we're, we're all aware that music serves different aspirations in society. Often it has played a central role in political and social movements. However, there are always guaranteed tectonic shifts in political and social trends. And these affect belief systems of society. So art, for me personally, has to progress within this panorama. It cannot remain static. Otherwise, we end up with art that is homogenous and completely irrelevant to the time that we live in. But resistance in art does not necessarily need to be a political one. When I look at my own artistic journey, in my case, I was never interested in creating music for the sake of entertainment because I was drawn to its transformative nature, its transformative quality, how the human sensorium can be influenced and altered by certain sonic input. And when I aspired to make music with that intention, the first thing I learned 
is that music is not a transaction. It is a communion. This is the biggest distinction I can draw between music that is created for the purpose of entertainment, which has its place in society. It even has a place in my life. Um, and music that is created to inspire thought and reflection and to elevate us to a higher state and hopefully beyond that to inspire individual and social transformation. So today, if you asked me after all the roles that I have struggled with, how would I define my role as a woman and an artist? I would say it is really one of a disruptor. I believe it is crucial for us in society to have artists who disrupt and destabilize the hierarchical systems that we are indoctrinated into, in which the belief systems of some determine for the rest of us or want to determine for the rest of us, the ranking, the status, the legitimacy of some art forms or some styles over others. This is why I always say that art should make one a skeptic there are no absolute truths in art. If anything, there's this always present dichotomy, this very clear distinction between belief and truth and how power is assigned to them. And it is our job as artists to never, to make sure that we never place our beliefs as truths in the service of power. So from this perspective, I consider art to be a kind of honorable mutiny against the dominant narrative and the constructs. Because what it is, is a call to collective action. For those of us who are incredibly privileged, incredibly fortunate to live in a secular society, it is solely through art that we find meaning and bring dignity to the universal human experience. I think that's a beautiful note to end on. So I will end it there. Thank you very much for having me, for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the journey. I hope if nothing else, it has inspired some new ideas and I look forward to your questions. I will pass it on to Professor Amuzegov. Um, Azamjan, thank you for that wonderful presentation and taking us through your journey. This was really, really insightful and there are many comments. So I'm just going to get right to it. Thank you again. Um, thank you. <laughs> it's really amazing. Um, maybe I'll start with the, one of the questions that few different people have uh, um, expressed differently. And that is, as an artist, do you think of yourself as an Iranian artist? Or how does your Iranian background and roots work into your presence as an artist? That's, that, that's really a wonderful question. Um, once again, I, I, it's difficult for me to, to answer anything without taking into consideration identity because it's sort of the, at the root of everything. Um, I personally, as I said earlier, for me, my place of birth, all of these were, were a very arbitrary event. It does not mean I don't take pride in being Iranian. What it does mean is that I don't have a religious or nationalist agenda. And sometimes I have faced some backlash for that, that I'm not Iranian enough for some Iranians. Or for example, I, I sing a lot of folkloric music from the entire Persian Gulf region. So why do I sing in Turkish or, you know, in Arabic or Kurdish, or why don't I just sing only in Farsi? So I, I do sometimes uh, face that, but, but this is what I like to remind people is my, my agenda is largely a humanist one. And I'm more interested in um, 
I, I was in Professor Amuzagar's class a week ago, and, and I said this, if I ever had to write a biography of my life, I would title it The Decolonization of Azam Ali, because a lot of my interests are about sort of going back to Iran prior to geographical borders, when we were, where, where there was not the singular Iranian identity. I don't personally, um, I, don't, I do not subscribe to that singular Iranian identity. I see Iran more as a combination of different ethnicities, different religions that have all contributed to this beautiful mosaic that has made Iran the incredible civilization that it was. And I am more interested in taking it apart as a modern artist. So, um, so in, from that perspective, I would say I don't see myself as an Iranian artist, but the first question if somebody asks me is where are you from? I say I'm Iranian. So that again goes back to we live in a world where we are constantly being asked to identify ourselves. <laughs> Absolutely, wonderful. A um, Couple of uh, questions that relate somewhat closely and I'll ask them separately from you. Um, who are some of the female artists that have influenced you? And do you admire both Iranian and non-Iranian, I would assume artists would need to come after that, or vocalists? Absolutely. One of, one of the great things is that I, I always love to listen to music from, from all over the world. My, my area of particular interest and passion was folkloric music. So that started in India when I moved to India when I was four. And then later on when I was, uh, when, when actually when I came to America is really when I began my journey of self-discovery into mm -hmm. Iranian music. I started with the Santur and then I got heavily into folkloric music of Iran. So Sima Bina is probably my greatest inspiration from that perspective in Turkey. It would be Sabahat Akiraz. She comes from the Alevi Bektashi tradition. They are a minority religious group in Turkey. And um, so, so there are various uh, folkloric uh, female singers. And then later on, I went to study actually early music. So the music of Hildegard von Bingen, she was a mystic, a, a Christian mystic. So I studied a lot of that style of music and I had my vocal training actually in that style of music. So there are many female artists who have inspired me in, in, in that sense, not just Iranian. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. And the second follow-up question, um, you seem very inspired by Sufism. How do you relate to Sufi or mystical thinking? Well, it's, you know, it's strange that I, when, I, when I sit in a lot of Iranian gatherings today, there is such, because we, we all to a certain degree suffer from PTSD with regards to religion because we went through a revolution. But in some ways I feel that we threw the baby out with the bathwater because on one hand, there is an aversion to anything that has a spiritual connotation to it. While at the same time, you will not, there is a certain generation of Iranians who have memorized a large portion of Iranian poetry, such as Molana's poetry, Rumi's poetry. Um, so, so many poets, they can just recite them for you. And these are very spiritual for me in nature but somehow it's been kind of disconnected. And I don't know if it's because of growing up in India and I studied Buddhism a lot and while I was there and you know, just growing up in a kind of mystical environment. I did not grow up in a religious, in a very religious environment, like particularly. Um, so maybe that has something to do with it. Um, I my experience with music, the earliest experience I have with music was spiritual music uh, coming out of temples in India. 
And I remember it did something to my sensorium. It, it altered my, my perception as a child and the sensations that I had. And I think in many ways growing up, I, I, I try to capture that even when I sit in a room or to write, I, I'm almost trying to capture that same feeling that I had of where music takes you. And Sufism, I think is perhaps an easy reach for me just because culturally it's so, it's so close to where I am and the poetry. And I don't have to go through a huge process of appropriating something that is not a part of my, uh, my DNA and my bloodstream, it's in my blood. So it becomes something that's highly accessible and I relate to it. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, Shahla has a question and she asks, how can women find their rightful place and equal rights and opportunities in countries like Iran? And do you think we have achieved it in the West? I think it's, that's also under construction, so to speak, you know, it's, uh, I mean, no doubt we've come a long way in the West, but I mean, we still see so many movements continuing towards um, equal rights, equal pay for women, I mean, the struggle continues to varying degrees. I, I never, actually one of the workshops I hold is called Feminism in the East. And I do a comparative look at the rise of feminism in the East and the rise of feminism in the West. And it's, it's almost incomparable, you can't, because it's different circumstances led to different movements. So I, I actually do not like, even though I do the comparative look for the sake of, um, I do it conceptually, I don't think it can really be compared. And once again, I don't like to speak to the struggle of women in Iran because I don't know what it's like to, to struggle in Iran. And I, I think if I was a woman, a singer or an artist in Iran right now, I would actually be offended if a woman was living in the Western world and had the freedom to create music and travel everywhere and perform everywhere for decades would sit there and speak on my behalf. So I don't like to speak on the behalf of women. All I can do is, is kind of listen to them. And if they ask me to amplify their voice in one particular area, I amplify their voices. Otherwise I remain silent and just keep fighting my own fight on this end as an artist in diaspora. Because I think one thing I do know is what it is to be an artist and to struggle as an artist in diaspora. You know, the, another thing we discussed in your class was how a lot of, of global music artists, they become famous first in their country of origin and then their music is exported outside. Whereas for, for women like myself, um, where you have a revolution and you cannot perform in your own country of birth. I've never performed in Iran. It, building a career outside of your homeland is almost an impossible task. Sometimes I don't even know how I managed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful. Um, two, I'm going to ask two questions that are somewhat related and you have alluded to but I think it's really important um, for me to ask them. Um, you are very outspoken with your political views and opinions. As an artist, do you feel it is your duty to use your platform to share your personal opinion on politics? And do you think other artists have a duty to do the same? And perhaps a follow-up question to that, which I really um, found interesting is, how are some ways that motherhood has shaped your art and activism? It's good you put those two questions together because they are deeply intertwined. When, when you become a mother, you become aware that you're not just going to live this ephemeral life and, and leave. You, you become aware that there is a sense of continuity once you are gone, that there will be others. 
And therefore, what you leave behind becomes incredibly important, your legacy. Not just a legacy, uh, in my case, of music, but my legacy as a human being. How much have I contributed to mankind while I've been here? I hope if I'm fortunate enough to live to become an old woman, um, I don't think at that point it's really going to matter to me how many albums I recorded, how many awards I got, how many countries I toured, and none of that is going to matter. What's going to matter is how many lives I changed for the better and how much good I have done in this world. I think that will have more value for me. So to that end, I think since the first day I got on a stage and that microphone was in front of me, I felt this tremendous responsibility. I didn't feel I was just there to sing. I felt that it was a privilege to have that mic in front of me and the ears of so many people. And that if I did not use that opportunity to speak about those who struggle, those who suffer injustices, that that moment in front of a microphone would be completely wasted. So yes, I do feel a great weight of responsibility. And, and it's more so as I get older to speak about things. I do often get a lot of hate mail, shut up and saying, nobody wants to hear your political views. And I just, I just swat those away like flies, you know, I don't, I don't let them get to me. I do not judge any other artist for not being political or being political because it's a, actually a very difficult thing to do. What you're doing is exposing yourself. Even sometimes my partner, Ramin Turkian, who's also my husband, you know, he, he sometimes wishes that I, I might be more careful because he worries for me. It's more that he worries for my safety, but he has never, not even once in the two decades, ever once said to me, don't say that or don't do that. Um, I, see, I may see it sometimes in his eyes, but there's a tremendous respect and understanding that, that we have also a parallel mission besides um, the art itself. So I don't judge other artists, but I do feel that it is my duty Wonderful, thank you. Um, um, moving back to music, um, how do you, um, and what inspires you to choose your lyrics and what you sing? And from that, are there any specific languages that you still wish you could sing or you like to explore singing? How do I choose my lyrics? Actually, it's uh, normally, uh, for the folk songs, um, I, I know we talked about this also, it's, it should be interesting for people to hear it, but when I, when I moved to America, it's not like now where you can go on YouTube and you can listen to, you know, any style of music, any kind of music that's being created in the remotest island in the world, you can find it. When, when I came to America, that, that was not the case. You know, we did not have YouTube and internet. So I remember I used to go every weekend while all my friends were having fun. I used to go and spend hours in the Persian bookstores in Westwood. And I would ask them to bring out their bins of, um, of cassette tapes of folk music. And I used to sit there for hours and, and go through them to collect, to collect songs. And um, so a lot of my search for folk Folkloric music is still very much that same way. Perhaps now it's more on YouTube than it was before. But in terms of the poetry, uh, if it's the Iranian poetry, my reading is very, very slow um, and rudimentary when it comes to Farsi. Uh, so normally we'll sit with Ramin and we'll read. And if there's a poem that kind of really resonates with us, we'll say, okay, let's take that. And, um, and work with that. Lately, Ramin has been uh, writing a, a lot of the lyrics because um, just of subject matters that we are working on. But in terms of other languages, 
I would say the easiest language for me to sing in is Turkish after Farsi. Um, I, I have no idea why that is. I have one rule about when I sing in other languages, I will never record a song if I have to place a lyric sheet in front of me because I, that means I have not internalized those words. So um, some of the most difficult languages are um, certain dialects of Kurdish are very difficult for me. Kurmanji is very difficult for me, even though I've really wanted to sing um, a few songs in Kurdish. But at the end, I felt that I did not do them justice. Uh, sometimes I struggled with Arabic. So I have friends who I work with very closely on those languages. So when I'm singing in another language, I'll usually work with someone who is uh, well versed in that language and, um, and they sort of guide me. I'm always open to singing in, in any language. So it's it's just a matter of what I feel I can memorize, internalize, make my own, and then really put my heart and my soul into it. Wonderful, thank you. Um, there are a number of questions about Niaz and how the how uh, you all uh, came together to produce your music, and a question from that also: How would you distinguish the music of Niaz from your solo music? Well, my, all my, I have four solo albums now, I think, and they're all incredibly different. You know, my early music one, my, the lullaby album I did for my son and all children in dia that are born in diaspora. And then my most recent one is all English and very electronic. So each one is quite different. My so I... I wouldn't say I necessarily have an interest in having a solo career because what I thrive, I thrive on collaborations. I love when I sit in a room with another musician and I have a visceral reaction to something that they do. And it's something that would never happen to me if I was alone in a room creating. So I'm very much interested in that aspect of working with others and I, I just enjoy it's such a solitary life anyway being a musician and an artist that every chance you get to just be with with someone else it's it's a blessing uh, my solo work ends up being music that does not fit really with Niaz I we, we kind of think of Niaz as our mothership we built this beautiful ship that is sailing and then there are just these little boats that we we attach to this beautiful ship and it, they, it kind of pulls it along. So, so if I had to really describe it, that it would, it would be as simple as that, that my solo albums are, are really albums of where my interest takes me. Uh, also, I'm, I cannot just be in one mode. Mm -hmm. So Niaz is a very particular mode. It's a very ethnic mode and I have a completely different side of me that I need to express. So if I'm too much in one mode, I, I have to kind of break free and express the other side and then come back and have something to offer. Wonderful. Um, would you briefly describe the instruments behind you? There have been a number of comments and questions. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad to explain uh, when, when Ramin is not here, they're his instruments. So, um, this is actually, maybe I can bring them. So this is the Robab. This one is actually from Afghanistan, but uh, Ramin has one that was made in Iran. It's not in this room right now. Um, that's the Robab. Then he has the guitar viol. So this is the guitar viol. This is an incredible instrument. So this is a, he has both the acoustic and the electric version. So this was made, this is a revolutionary instrument that was made by um, a local instrument maker. His name is Jonathan Wilson. And um, Ramin's actually started off as a violin player and then he moved on to guitar. And then he actually uh, created the quarter tone guitar. And then he became obsessed with why no one has made a boat guitar. So I remember even before Niaz, like two decades ago, this is a long time ago, he started looking for someone who could make a boat guitar and he found Jonathan Wilson. And 
and Jonathan, he, he, Jonathan was making these for himself and he said he had never made one for anyone else. So he started, he made one for Ramin. I think it took two years, something like that. And then um, this instrument is really like sort of the foundation of Niaz and almost all the work that we do right now. And now Jonathan Wilson's uh, career has, I mean, every single prominent Hollywood music composer has one of these in their studio now. So um, it's called the guitar viol, but this one is called the Kaman, which he made specifically for Ramin because it has quarter tones. And then what else did we have? So that's the electric version and that's it. There are other ones which you can't see, but I don't want to take all the time. I have a lot of frame drums. I collect too many frame drums. So they're in the back over there. Um, I have my Santur over there. So um, a lot of instruments. Wonderful, Azamjan. Thank you so much. Um, in this last few minutes, I wanted to ask a question um, um, based on your presentation, one of the very provocative uh, um, comments that has me thinking, and that was about the exploitation of suffering and what it meant to you and how it shaped your music. I would be grateful if you could speak to that a little bit, because that's profound, and I'd love to know how that's shaping your music and musical experiences um, now. Are you exploiting my suffering by asking me to talk about it? <laughs> no, no. no. Important topic. <laughs> no. Um, yes, actually I've been asked, uh, this is actually, um, I, I based, uh, not, not the entire talk, but portions of it are based on an essay that I've written, which you read. And um, it's something, it's, the essay is also something I would be happy to make available to anyone in academia who's interested in reading it. But anyone who has read the essay has always asked me to elaborate more on that point, that it's such an important point. It, it is a very sore subject. It, it is an incredibly sore subject for me because I have, if, when I look back, I have given entire interviews where let's say the interview was, if it was half an hour or one hour, about 90% of it, I was expected to talk about my struggles and my suffering. And it seemed that th this became much more interesting for people. I don't know if that has to do with, once again, this Orientalism of, um, because inevitably, why, why, why talk about those things? Because then the, you're coming back to this idea that you don't have those struggles here. You don't have that same suffering here, which is true. There, I have deep gratitude for the career I have here, the life I have here, that I know I could not, even in Europe, I could not be where I am in my career today. It's really a blessing of having come to America. But it's difficult for me when, when my art cannot stand on its own, but it has to be held up by my struggles and my suffering. I want my art and my music to be able to stand on its own. No doubt the journey has shaped the music that I make. I mean, a lot of people say my music is very sad. Some say it's very spiritual. Um, I don't think every, anyone has ever said my music is happy. So I, I think it's such a personal thing for me that I don't like to talk about much. I put it in my music. I pour all of my pain and my experience into my music so that this pain I think any musician can relate to that, where you put your pain into what you do and it transforms. It transforms to the point of illumination. This interests me more than the pain itself, this transformation and the point of illumination. I, I wish to talk more about that 
the pain I'm going to put in the art, it's private, it's personal. So it has shaped me, but I, I will not dwell on that publicly. Wonderful. Um, if I may, I just maybe would extend us for a couple of more minutes and ask you um, to comment on um, what William wrote. Um, he talks about the Fajr festival and how women in Iran have gradually been accepted to be part of all these different performances, although they can still be lead singers and they can't, they can only sing for female audiences. Um, do you see that as a progression? Um, he would love to know your feelings about that. I think every step is a progress. I, I don't believe um, that Iran is going to just change one day. You know, we had the, the, the revolution was so jarring and it was so sudden that I, I don't think um, going back, it's going to be the same way. I think it's going to be very, very slow. And every step, is, is going to be instrumental in, the in making sure that the next one happens. So absolutely, it's progress. I'm not hopeful that I will ever perform in Iran in my lifetime, but hopefully the work that I do will ensure that other artists like myself, there are so many wonderful Iranian artists in diaspora now all over the world, who are younger than me and there are others who are coming up and I hope that the work that we do will make it possible for them to go and perform there. That's really, really wonderful. Um, this has been a really um, amazing, amazing presentation and really the discussion has been so fascinating and I'm really thankful to you for being here and really talking to us about what matters the most, your music and how you reach out and really touch um, audiences. Um, if I may, in conclusion, maybe to um, send my gratitude to you, I'm just gonna read Elham's comment uh, and that would sum it up for all of us. Please tell Azam a big thank you for being so incredibly genuine and true to herself and sharing the honesty with us in the form of enchanting music. Also, thank her for always standing on the side of justice and not being afraid to voice that and so eloquently for that matter. I wanna thank you as I'm, you. It's been a wonderful, wonderful conversation with you. I'm really thankful to you. Uh, once again, I want to thank everybody for being here the past week and today it has been amazing. My gratitude to Farhang Foundation once again, and I look forward to having a lot more of these events in the near future. I want to thank everybody for being here. It's been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.